Find and learn from people who lived it wherever you get podcasts. Search it using all one word. Learn from people who lived it. Welcome to another episode of Learn from People Who Lived It. I'm excited about this one today, friends. Dope Black Dads. That's an organization started by the guy who is to my right right now on the video if you're watching and the voice you will soon hear if you are listening. I think most everybody knows that about a year ago, I made that huge decision in my life to walk away from my career so that I could lean into self-care, spend more time with my wife, my kids, get back to the things that were really meaningful to me. And I'm excited to see what our next guest has to say about that and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, uh, Umar, welcome to the podcast. How are you, buddy? I'm good, Matthew. How are you doing? Uh, listen, I'm excited to get into this whole thing with you today. You and I just kind of briefed before we jumped on and we said, let's talk mm-hmm. about fatherhood. Let's talk about our kids. Let's talk about our wives. Um, and, and I'm here for that conversation right now because there's a lot of shifting taking place in our culture, our society. And I think you can agree, right? There's more and more okay. fathers like you and I who are kind of stepping up and going, maybe we could do this differently than our dads did. Yes, Maybe absolutely. we could do this differently than our moms did. You know what I mean? There's a lot of parents that are just coming to an understanding, really embracing the new language and, and, and some of the terms that we're learning within mental mm-hmm. wellness and what that means. And so how did you get started in all of this, man? What was the thing for you to jump off and start Dope Black Dads and do all the things that you've been doing for the last decade? Well, I have to confess, I'm, I'm one of like, I, I got involved with Dope Black Dads probably about less than a year after it started. Although, okay. and, and I'm kind of, you know, Marvin Harrison was the guy that set it all up. So he kind of, um, Father's Day a few years ago, he literally just set up a WhatsApp group on his phone, text a group of his friends who were fathers, because he was feeling a bit low about the whole concept of Father's Day and what it meant to be a father. And he wasn't sure about kind of, you know, is this something, is this normal? Is this, you know, this this feeling of being a dad? Is it you know not feeling this fulfillment you know where's the fulfillment where's the fulfillment coming uh so he's kind of set it up with a group of dads and then suddenly people were starting to share um their own stories and their own kind of experiences and then from that he just decided you know what i want to create an organization i want to do something to kind of give back to the community because there's clearly conversations to be had around the issues to do with fatherhood and especially within the black community as well and what that actually means and kind of the perceptions that people have of black fathers so i got involved with dope black dads as i said less than a year after it was formed uh marvin had contacted me uh to do a podcast with him around mental health uh because i'm a lawyer that specializes in mental health issues here in the uk and we just got talking we vibed we had a really good podcast and i really loved what they were doing and I was like, I want to be involved with this. Um, how can I be involved with this? Uh, and literally since then, I've just been part of the drive to kind of help push what Dope Black Dads is about, push the message, trying to increase that visibility, trying to change. Effectively, we're trying to change the narrative of what it means to be a black father in the UK and beyond. So Dope Black Dads has got, uh, predominantly we're here in the UK, uh, but we have got a chapter out in New York and we've got a chapter in South Africa as well. So it's very much about trying to expand, get fathers involved, be part of that process. And as you, as you were saying at the beginning, it's very much about trying to parent in a way that our own parents didn't do things um, and trying to embrace what is going on now in society and the changes that that brings with it. I'm, 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 I'm find myself wanting to ask you a couple of questions out of the gate. And the first one is, I think we have this kind of unique global opportunity between the two of us to examine what happens in the UK, what happens in America. Um, w- give me, give me an idea of w- what kinds of things you think you're up against in the UK as a dad. And then I'd love to tell you what I think is going on in America and see where our similarities are. Yeah, I think in the UK, <clears throat> There's, there's a number of issues. I think for a lot of us, we are, you know, first generation that were born here in the UK. So my parents originally came from Nigeria. They came here in the, uh, in the early 80s. A lot of my friends got parents that come from Nigeria, from Ghana, from the West Indies, especially, you know, the Windrush generation. So for a lot of them, they experienced a lot of 
trauma by the ways of racism. There was a lot of racism that took place that they were confronted with uh, growing up in the in in those eras. And I think as a result, they were kind of seen as less in this country. And that situation has kind of continued to perpetuate itself in in other ways. And I think there is definitely an issue, there is an issue of around institutional racism, which kind of does exist uh, within certain structures and institutions. And I think things like that have kind of helped, in a way, just hold the black community down a little bit. And we're kind of now in a place where, you know, a lot of us that were first generation born here, we're more educated than our parents are. Um, we probably don't identify ourselves as being working class in the same way that our parents are. A lot of us would identify nowadays as being quite middle class or beyond because of what we do the nature of it so we're having to deal with a lot of kind of the issues that our parents faced so that generational trauma that's been passed down because of their experiences and we're trying to kind of break that cycle so that we're not passing that down to our own children so the experiences that i had growing up i was fortunate in that i didn't face much racism compared to what my parents did and especially the area that I lived in, one of the most diverse areas in the whole of Europe. So that that didn't really present itself for racism as such. But I kind of feel like, you know, as I progressed becoming a lawyer, you know, being a lawyer in the UK is a very much a white middle class institution. And I definitely felt like I faced some institutional racism trying to break into the law. Uh, now it's you know it's all good. Obviously, I've been practicing for for over a decade now. So, but there were those issues, and and I'm trying to kind of and the same with my wife, trying to avoid passing on our own experiences, our parents' experiences down to our children, and trying to really create a new way of doing things and a new way of looking at stuff. Yeah, that's really healthy. And I'll tell you, I think the, a lot of the same things are true here in America, especially for, you know, for black fathers, right, who are coming here, maybe their first, second generations. And again, really, the story to me is trauma. It's not about being a first or a second or a third generation. It's about experiencing trauma. And mm-hmm. as a mental health professional or somebody that's in the space, you know, really well, like if mom and dad had to go through a lot, there's a really mm-hmm. good chance that a good chunk of that's going to get passed down to you. Um, Absolutely. You know, I mean, we say all the time, what grandma went through, mom went through, what daughter goes through. I mean, these Mm. things happen. And if you believe like I do, like the body keeps the score, especially with regards Mm. to trauma, there's a really good chance that even if you somehow had a a better than your mom or your grandmother, there's still some things that have been passed down to you that you're going to have to navigate at some point point in your life. And I wonder about the thing you said about being the first generation. Did you find yourself having to struggle with some of the cultural things that maybe mom and dad wanted to hold true, but didn't necessarily resonate with you as a, as a kid growing up in the UK around the different set of circumstances? Absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, cause I remember when I was younger, it was very much about even like traditional clothing, right? Food. It right. was very much like, yeah, but I don't really fancy wearing this. Like, why should I have to wear this? Like, <laughs> right. my friends aren't wearing this kind of stuff. And I think I didn't understand then. Now, you know, the, the whole world has gone very Afrocentric in terms of you know Afri- African clothing and and music and stuff. So now it's like quite cool to be an African or of African descent. When I was growing up, that was never the case because people associated being African at that time with, okay, you know, live aid. That's what people would think because of that, you know, Ethiopia. So everyone assumed that coming from Africa meant, you know, we lived in mud huts or, you know, we, we, we wore no shoes or there's no kind of civilization, which is absolute bull because, you know, there is a lot of civilization. Don't get me wrong. There are still people who live in mud huts, but that's not the majority. But I think that's the perception that people had of us. So therefore I kind of was rejecting a lot of that growing up. One thing I will say is my parents would speak to me in their native tongue, which is something that I have, I'm, I'm grateful for because I've been able to use that kind of growing up and actually being dual, you know, bilingual is a massive help because now, you know, whenever I do go to Nigeria, I can communicate and people kind of look at me like, Oh, okay. So you can speak, How's that? And, it's, and in a way, 
it's like a testament to my parents because people will see it as an extension of, oh, actually, so they've gone to the UK, but they haven't forgotten where they've come from. So in a way, there's like, there's that level of kudos to my parents for making sure that we've got that. But also for me, it's very much about, I can hold on to my identity. And I think as I've gotten older, <clears throat> and especially I think since I met my wife, I feel like I've embraced my culture more so than I ever did before when I was younger. So my wife is also Nigerian. Um, I'm from the North, uh, predominantly Muslim from the South. She's Christian. So like there's loads of things around that, uh, you know, th th those dynamics that go on. But I think she really helped me to kind of embrace my Nigerianness a bit more as I've kind of grown up and kind of realized actually, yeah, it, it's cool. Like Nigeria is the biggest population, populous country in Africa. You know, we've got, we've done a lot of stuff like over the years, like we've contributed a lot to society and actually it's a cool thing to, to be Nigerian. And now I'm very proudly saying, yeah, you know, I'm Nigerian, British or British Nigerian, you know, doesn't matter, but I'm happy to embrace that. But I certainly think there was a period when I was younger where I rejected that. But I think part of that was because of the circumstances and the environment that I kind of grew up in. I was just going to say, man, that's all to me. That's all your environment. And you don't even have mm. to be a psychologist to understand that. It's like if I'm a kid and I'm I've moved to a new neighborhood and I got kids making fun of me or I can feel like there's some sort of a, a thing there. Um, I'm going to start to feel bad about where I came from. And I'm going to start to feel like maybe it was less than and maybe these people are better than me. And so that makes mm -hmm. perfect sense to me that that's going to go down. I want to jump in the deep end with you for for, for a minute and and just say, you know, you talked about generational cycles, generational traumas. When I speak mm -hmm. to people now, I talk about the concept of transitional character being uh, mm -hmm. being that transitional character in your lineage. Perhaps you're the person here that's that's here to end the dysfunction and make life better for future generations. Maybe that's your role. Mm -hmm. And so have you been able to break some generational cycles from would, the kinds of yeah. things your, your, your dad did and his dad did? Yeah, absolutely. Because, I, I mean, I never, unfortunately, like most three out of my four grandparents all died before I was even born. Okay. So I've only ever had one grandparent to kind of refer to uh, on my mum's side. So it's my, my, my grandmother. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> on, on that side, I think um, I, I never really... Uh, got to I mean, I've had I've tried to have conversations with my dad about it in the past but I think he's, he's been a bit reluctant to kind of talk too much about you know what his dad's experiences were but certainly I think when I look at how my dad was growing up you know he was there he was present very much you know the educator because he used to be um he used to he used to be a teacher when he was in Nigeria then he came over to the UK was working as a broadcaster then became a civil servant um so he's very much like his drive his work ethic has definitely passed on down to me and I think what I've done with it is to utilize it in a way that allows me to build up skills build up experiences and really kind of monetize myself in a way that perhaps he wasn't able to do uh, because I think for him being here in the UK it was very much about, okay, I need to make enough money to make sure I can get all three of my children through university. They've got a roof over their heads. There's always food on the table, you know, able to get from A to B. I can give some money sometimes. That's it. That's kind of like, that was the function that came over to the UK specifically to be able to do that. For me now, it's very much about, okay, it's not just about, I want to give my kids food and shelter it's also about trying to set up you know structures that hopefully can help to benefit them and also kind of legacy building that's kind of where i'm kind of thinking now so for my parents it's very much about survival and trying to thrive for me it's now about thriving and expanding on that and trying to kind of create legacy so that when i move on and you know when my wife moves on for the kids, it's very much like, okay, well, this is what mum and dad did when they were alive. And now we want to take it to 
the next level as well. So it's kind of like trying to shift that mindset from being, we're just here to thrive. Sorry, we're just here to survive to actually thriving and excelling in whatever it is that you choose to do. Yeah, I'm really passionate about survival mode because I don't think it's, I mean, listen, we all go through it from time to time, but it's not a, mm-hmm. it's not a good long, dis, uh, long distance strategy, right? Like you can't, you can't sustain survival for forever without serious wounds to you and everybody around you is kind of how I, I see the whole thing. How did you get into, or what made you want to get into the mental wellness, mental health space? It, it get, it's kind of by accident actually, because really? I was, um, when I was, yeah, cause when I was training to become a lawyer here in the UK, so normally you have to do three different areas of law before you can qualify. So initially I started doing work in kind of the welfare benefits area. And then one of my friends has said to me, Oh, I think you'd be quite good in, you know, the mental health sphere because, you know, you, my background previously was that I was in kind of youth and community work uh, before I became a lawyer. I'd been a youth act- activist as a youngster. Um, I'd been elected as a member of youth parliament for the UK youth parliament. So I've always been very community centered and very much about challenging the status quo and challenging people. So when the opportunity arose for mental health, I said, okay, well, I'll go and give it a go. And, uh, you know, very much I loved it and I still do because it's about advocating for those in society whose voices are not necessarily heard by others. So for me, it's very much about being able to listen to those stories and then think about, okay, how can I help you? You know, a lot of times they just want to, they don't want to be institutionalized anymore. They want to leave the hospital. They want to be able to go back into the community and function in the community with some support. So my role then is like, okay, how can we, how can I help to facilitate that? So I kind of fell into it. I've obviously been doing it for over 10 years now. Uh, So I enjoy it. And I think I'm fascinated by the way mental health is, how it works. Um, I, I myself have had my own bout um, I suffered from reactive depression a few years ago. I had a kind of recurrence of it about a year or so ago. And I think it kind of gives me that space to to kind of try and, as I say, advocate for other people, help other people. And I'm quite passionate about trying to make sure that everyone gets the best in society, really. What does that mean for you when you say reactive depression? I too, I mean, listen, the reason you, you and I don't know each other, uh, and mm-hmm. and we're getting to learn. But uh, I was a like your father. I was a broadcaster for twenty seven years, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I walked away last year after a pretty public uh, mental health battle myself, mm-hmm. and needed to go and get brand new tools and get some serious healing uh, surrounding a few things from my childhood that I had experienced some difficult things along the way. So, what does mm-hmm. reactive depression mean? for you what is that like zero in on that a little bit so i think for me reactive depression has meant taking on too much at the same time and kind of not knowing how to deal with it and then this feeling of like i'm not good enough Mm. i can't handle what i'm doing Mm. and then end up kind of making errors and then just falling into this trap of like not knowing how to ask for help, not knowing how to deal with certain issues, and then just end up retreating a little bit to the point where it becomes very detrimental in that I become quite withdrawn. I, I become, you know, I don't want to engage with people or if I am out with people, I'm very much like I'd rather be anywhere but here, leave me alone. I just want to be on my own. I don't want to speak to people. So that's kind of what it's meant for me um over the years and i think what i realized is it happens when i feel like i don't have a sense of purpose (laughs) or a sense of i'm doing something that is making a difference somewhere you know to someone i mean don't get me wrong obviously you know as a dad you you know you you feel like you're always doing something every day for your kids and you, you always feel like you're you're making a difference same with your you know with your partners and stuff but I think it got to a point where I just felt like I'm doing all this stuff, but I'm not getting any kind of joy or fulfillment out of it. And why am I doing it? And and I think, you know, when you get to that point, you then start to, it, it then becomes a bit of a, I can't be bothered with this anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do it. And then it just slowly, 
it's not like an instant thing, but it just kind of, it creeps in. And then my whole demeanor just changes bit by bit by bit to the point where, you know, my wife will kind of look at me and be like, you're depressed. Something needs to change. Like what's, I can see you've been declining for a long time. I just thought you were going through a blip, but clearly not because it's going on. You seem to have a permanent cloud over your head. Mm. Like, you know, you have a couple of bright spots here and there, but then, you know, it just goes back and like the slightest thing just knocks you down. And I, and it's funny because I was speaking to a good friend of mine um, earlier on today, actually. Uh, I haven't spoken to her for a while. I think last time I saw her was at, um, she did the summer party and she was saying that, you know, you're one of the most resilient people I've ever met. I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, think about all the stuff that you've gone through over the years. But look, at, listen to how you're sounding now and just listen to how you, you've kind of learned how to, to deal with that, but also not let it knock you down and kind of, you know, you're still pushing through. And, I, and, I, and you know, I was driving along, we were t- chatting along and I was just like, you're right. Yeah, I am quite a resilient person because I think, you know, obviously for depression, it can lead to different things for different people. You know, we know, you know, we know about suicide rates when it comes to men, especially under the age of 45. You know, there's a high level of suicide rate. So, you know, that's the extreme of it. Or it can be that people find ways to, to cope with it through medication, through therapies, you know, whatever it is. And I think I've realized, you know, because I've done the whole medication thing, I've done therapy, and I think I realized that it's about if I have no sense of purpose, then almost certainly that depression is going to kick back in at some point. I need to always have a sense of purpose. I always need to have a a why. Why am I doing this? What what is what's and what's the goal? What is the end goal? I think as long as I've got that and I always have that in the forefront of my mind and whatever it is I'm doing, then I feel like I'm all right. Yeah, this is a great conversation to have surrounding purpose. Mm. Because you and I, first up, everything you're describing there, I feel like you and I are the same human being, uh, yeah. which is great, right? Because my, the, I told you at the onset, the goal of this podcast is to help people feel less alone. And so already you help yeah. me feel less alone because I, I experience yeah. a lot of the same things. So mm-hmm. I know how I figured out my purpose. Um, mm. What do you do for yourself? You know, what's in the tool bag there for you to, to pull out when your wife comes to you and she's like, okay, it's been... Spend six weeks now or whatever the, the mm-hmm. time is, you know, what what are you doing to try to step yourself back in? I think I I like to reflect. And one thing I've been doing a lot of has been to journal. So funnily enough, I um I went to San Francisco back in May of this year. Uh, a friend of mine got married. So first time actually I'd traveled. Uh, well, yeah, first time I got on plane for about four years. Normally I love to travel. That's my thing. But obviously... COVID has happened. Uh, so that's not been possible. So I went on my own because kids were in school and it wasn't the holidays. And I loved it. Don't get me wrong. I miss my wife and I miss my children. But I just loved being on my own and just not having to do anything or not have to worry about the school run or having to worry about picking this person up or doing this act, whatever. Just having a sense of time to myself. And I was in, um, I think it was a Walmart that I was in um, just on the outskirts of San Francisco. And I I saw this like journal book and I was like, you know what? I'm going to start journaling again because I was doing it kind of electronically on my phone. But then I remember a friend of mine saying there's something therapeutic about actually having a pen and paper and writing it down and kind of this sense of whatever weight is on your shoulders just letting it be released and kind of go on pen and paper. And I was like, okay, cool. So I sat in a Starbucks just waiting and got got this book. And I was like, okay, and just started to write. And since then, I've just, you know, I journal. So one of of the things I like to do is, you know, I journal the good things, I journal the bad things. And I love playing on my Xbox or my Nintendo Switch. Like that, that for me is like, just let me have like an hour or two on that and I'm fine because I'm not really I don't drink um, you know don't do drugs or anything like that so for me it's just about I think in a way it's just having that sense of 
alone just being alone and also music i love music um, i've got such a wide taste in music and funnily enough one of the things my wife will say is like you know like when she goes to the gym she'll come back she'll be like gosh i i was enjoying that playlist that you had on the other day you know i, I like to put on 80s or 90s pop music because i just it, it just reminds me of growing up as a child um and i love it so i think it kind of takes me back to to that time but also it's just like yeah i love it it's kind of uplifting it's it's fun and uh it's enjoyable so i think things like that help me you know going out seeing my friends um going out to dinners with with friends of mine hanging out with my wife as well because i think one thing that i realized over the years is that importance and that value of having that one-on-one time because i think when you become a parent it's very easy to just become so engrossed in the kids lives and it's very much like you're on routine you're on like okay we're gonna go to we're gonna take them to school come back work pick them up feed them take them to an activity come back put them to bed all right we'll do the same again five days a week Mm -hmm. and actually it's so important to have you know being able to have day night so it was her birthday it was her birthday last week Uh, so after the kids went to school i took her out for brunch we had a nice brunch date we went to the cinema last friday to watch woman king and you know i think we're going out again on thursday so very much uh quite a lot (laughs) in a short, short space of time but um, you know, we try to make a thing of at least a couple of times a month just having that time together. So all of those things put together for me is what I kind of use as kind of like as my toolbox and kind of how I how I manage things, really. I just think it's brilliant. Uh, I'm a huge self-care advocate. And when you look up mm. self-care, uh, you know, in the dictionary and then you really kind of drill down on it, you find out that things like communication are your responsibility. That's a self-care responsibility, a.k.a. Journal- mm. journaling, right? You find yeah. out that creating a routine for yourself is your responsibility. That's a self-care uh, thing. And so, you know, you, you create some routine. Going out and spending mm. time with friends and laughing and having that connection point. Um, again, that's a self-care responsibility of, of you. And uh, I, so I love your tools. I think they're, they're brilliant. I think anybody can lean into them. Um, I know for a fact that we have an earlier podcast. I don't know where it is. It's maybe like in the 20s. But the, if you go back and you look at learn from people who lived at Lori Matola, she's a writing expert. And we did a whole podcast on journaling and free form writing and how beneficial it can be. Because when I was in my mental research, retreat, uh, my mental and spiritual retreat last summer, Mm. one of my healers said to me that it has to come out. Like whatever is inside, it has to come out. Whether you say it or you write it, it has to leave your body because until it leaves your body, it's in your body. And, you know, that can, that can really turn into some, some nasty stuff. I mean, we're, we're, we're drawing really crystal clear parallels between the mind body connection to pain and disease. And, mm-hmm. and I can, I can almost, you know, I can't cause I'm a doc, I'm not a doctor, but I can almost guarantee you that there's a lot of people who get to that point of neck ache, back ache, mm-hmm. uh, physical problems. Uh, and, and it's as a result of their mental health and how, and the impact that it's having on their, on their physical body i mean it's Mm -hmm. taxing to be worrying about things all the time right yeah no absolutely and i think that is uh, excuse me that is i think i've realized when you have those stresses and those worries going on your body reacts in that kind of way so you kind of you feel heavy you feel like not doing anything you don't sleep well your eating patterns go out of the window and i recognize i think When I'm eating a lot of junk food or if I'm eating a lot of crap, then it's like, okay, that's definitely, I'm eating my feelings effectively. Mm. Um, And that's a telltale sign actually. Because like, okay, yeah, there's something something wrong because I'm just, I'm eating way too much than I (laughs) normally should be eating. I'm not sleeping well enough because I'm, you know, getting three or four hours in a night and then I'm trying to function off of that and I'm drinking more coffee than i normally should do so i think yeah you have to have those kind of understandings of um those signs that are around because you need to see oh okay if that's happening because yeah and i know 
if there's a problem because my wife my wife will say something she'll be like mm, I've noticed you're drinking a few bit more fizzy drinks than you normally would so that's usually like a little subtle way of saying yeah you need to slow down or find something else to to, to, to do so and I have to say I mean my wife is amazing at kind of picking up cues and signals and she's very cognizant of when I'm going through stuff and you know she will try to help in her own way and kind of you know she'll raise she'll raise it um and I've I've become so attuned now so I think when she's saying certain things it's like okay yeah there's a problem brewing Uh, so let me ask you a question are you the kind of guy who when she calls you out and she says you know you're having a few more fizzy drinks. Are you somebody who's like, hey, you know what? Back off. I've had a long week. I've uh, had a lot on my mind. Or is it like message received? It's coming from my partner. It's coming from a place of love. She's not trying to control me. She's really trying to be my partner in this situation and help me. Um, how do you navigate that? Because you know how that can go, man. I mean, that can go both yeah. ways, right? I think it depends on the mood. that she <laughs> Fair enough. She fair enough. That's fair. Think- That's fair. Yeah, I think if if I'm in a good mood, then I'm like, okay, yeah, you're making a fair point. I think if I'm in a bad mood already, then there's a chance that I'm like, so, why, why does it bother you so much? <laughs> but actually, I know why it bothers her because one, it's not healthy. Two, it's kind of a sign that things aren't aren't necessarily okay. And three, she's worried that it may lead to you know me going back into a space that it's not good. So I always see that whenever there's any kind of intervention from her as much as I may not like it I know it's always coming from a place of love and I always try to remember that you know even if it's not in the moment but I, I think I'm one of these people that I don't I don't necessarily I don't hold grudges for like a long period of time so and I always say to her listen I may react in a defensive way to start off with but actually when I do think about what you're saying you know, I tend to go back and be like, you know, yeah, you were right. I was just annoyed that you said that. And actually, you know, it's a wake up call. No one likes to be, no one likes to hear anything bad said about them. Um, well, and don't you agree with the, I love the old Oprah adage, which is you'll never be angry with anybody but yourself, you know? And, mm-hmm. and I like that because it just, it puts it on us. And, you know, when, if your wife's going to come to you and she's going to say, you're having more fizzy drinks than you normally are. Okay. So why mm-hmm. do you get defensive? You get defensive because, you know, for, first up, you know, full well, you probably haven't been taking care of yourself. You haven't been treating yeah. yourself like you deserve to be taken care of. Mm-hmm. You know, you've mm-hmm. fallen into some slippery patterns for a few days and you hate being called down on it and so you're not necessarily mad with her you're, you're mad mm-hmm. at yourself for yeah. making the choices that you made to make it a thing where she even had to notice i mean i, I like mm-hmm. to break i mean does that resonate with you that's how i think i, oh. I break that down absolutely and yeah. i think i always i always say that you know if i'm angry it's not that i'm angry at her for saying things it's that i'm angry at myself so i think i definitely I'm able to reflect in that way and kind of recognize when things are not right. And I think my, I suppose my reaction is more out of, it's a frustration more at myself rather than it is at her. But obviously she's the one that's delivered the message. So therefore she gets the brunt of the, the, the the angry response as it were, but actually the angry response is because I can't just shout at myself in the mirror. So (laughs) I probably could, but yeah, it's just, you know, it's not the mirror that's telling me about myself at that point. So, yeah. As we uh, wind down the next 15 minutes here on our podcast, I want to talk about being a dad again <clears throat> and what that's going to mean for you for that. You know, you, I think you told me you have a four and a seven year old at home right now. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I wonder, you know, most of us can't really go back to the moment we were four. Maybe we can go back to the moment we were seven. But what are you hoping to do for your kids that might be different than what you had growing up? I think for me, it's very much about, and I think for both of us, actually, it's about choice Mm. kind of, you know, not trying to steer them in any particular direction, as it were. I think I was saying to you offline before, my daughter, she loves street dance. You know, she's so, she's really good at it as well. You know, she's won a few competitions considering she only started doing it in January. You know, she's won two competitions and she came second in a national championships as well. Uh, you know, so that's over a 10 month period. 
And I think if I had a talent growing up, I, well, I don't know if I did. I probably didn't. But I think my parents were very resistant to letting me do other things. So it was very much about school, home, homework, sleep, back to school. That was kind of the routine. Well, I think with our kids, it's very much about, okay, we're trying them out with so many different things. I was saying to you before, I took my son, you know, he, he goes to tennis lessons. He plays football, um, soccer for the, for, for the American listeners and viewers. Um, yeah, have to, but we call it football. So it's fine. Yeah, I, I, I know. <laughs> I'm not, a, I'm not a big American football person, so I am not offended in the least. Yeah. All good. I could care um, less. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so he plays football. He, he does, you know, they both do swimming. She does gymnastics. So we're trying to introduce them to as many different things as possible because we want them to have those experiences. And actually, you know, they may decide, well, actually, I don't fancy doing tennis anymore. I don't like football. I can't be bothered with it. Swimming is a non negotiable because we think that's a very important life skill to have, especially amongst the black community there's a high proportion of us adults who don't know how to swim. So we want to kind of try and break that, break that stereotype very quickly. But I think it's very much about choice and also really, I think understanding our children and being attuned to what they're into. So I know my daughter, she loves dancing. She loves gymnastics. She's very much a creative arts type of person. So I can see her going into the creative arts but rem- recognizing and reminding her that, you know, school still does come first. We're not going to stop you from doing these things, but school, you know, you still need to have some kind of a foundation behind you. But actually, we'll just encourage her. And that means going to dance competitions, going to dance meets and, you know, spending long days, uh, <laughs> you know, at these places. Same thing with my son. He's four years old and he's very studious already. And he very much, he loves to learn. So, and he's very good with his hands. So I kind of like, okay, I could see potentially where he may end up, you know, going into like engineering. So it's very much about trying to steer, not steer, but kind of give them the tools and give them the facilities to kind of explore their passions a bit more and then, you know, see what happens as they get older and kind of build upon it from there. So that's kind of what we're trying to do with our kids is to not, set them on a particular path but actually understanding them and being more attuned because i think for me growing up is very much like okay you have to be a lawyer a doctor or an accountant that is a standard black especially african thing to have to do uh obviously i've become a lawyer uh so i kind of you know i fall in that stereotype but on your terms bro but on your terms it was on my terms. That is very true. Uh, same as my wife. You know, she's a lawyer as well. Um, but yeah, I, but now I kind of, I feel like as I've gotten older, I'm now exploring other passions that I wasn't able to do in my younger age. And that's fine because, you know, I'm able to kind of utilize it in other ways. But certainly with the kids, it's very much about being attuned to them and then kind of working with it from there. Let's uh, wrap up on the concept of dope black dads and Ooh. potentially, you know, a, a black father listening to our podcast right now with young kids, younger mm-hmm. than yours, four and seven. Mm-hmm. Um, what kinds of things do you want him to know? I think what I want him to know is you're not alone. You know, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're feeling, trust me when I say we, there is somebody in the community, in the network who has probably gone through that if not probably worse than what you're experiencing. And I think it's important because especially I think men generally, we don't like to talk about our feelings and and stuff. I think black men, even more so, we struggle to kind of share our thoughts, our feelings about things. And we kind of will carry burdens and not want to disturb people with other things. And we kind of feel like it's our issues to bear. And I would say to any black father that's listening, it's not. You know, you can speak to the community. We are here to help, you know, wherever it is, we, we, you know, we can find a solution. If we don't have the answer directly, there will be somebody in the network that will have that answer. And just recognize being a father, being, you know, parent, husband, it's not easy. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it it's a struggle. It's a, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> if anyone's cracked that code, uh, please uh, feel free to message me on that. But yeah. 
it's not easy. You know, it's it's, yeah. it's 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 tough work because you know when you're when you're a, a dad, you know your your father, your husband, your work colleague, your bank, you're the taxi driver, you're the teacher. Same with mums as well. I'm not going to denigrate uh, mums' roles, but I think especially there's a lot of pressure on dads and I think a lot of that is societal so there's always been this expectation that the man is the person that will go out find the food come back feed the family go out work come back you know all of that kind of stuff it's changed obviously we're in 2022 now and it's a very different time you know women are working and you know doing a great job you know better than some of us I I say to my wife all the time I think out of the two of us you're much better lawyer than I am no question about it <laughs> you know I, I've, i'm not you know i'm good at what i do but i think you're better mm-hmm. um so you know kind of give her you know give her a kudos on that and i think you know as dads don't be afraid to mess up um obviously don't do anything that gets your kids taken away or anything like that but you know just don't be afraid to mess up and actually just reach out speak i think one of the biggest things that i found over the last few years being part of Do black has allowed me to kind of really connect with fathers. And I think without it, I think I would have really struggled to go on that kind of reflective journey to be able to heal, as it were. I'm still on that healing journey anyway. And I think it's not something that you just, you know, turn up to 10 sessions of therapy and you're you're sorted after that. No, you, you're on that journey, but it's that ongoing reflections that you need to undertake on a day-to-day basis and just know it's okay to mess up but it's just about how you deal with it and how you come back from that yeah buddy i say it all the time i i think some of the the most powerful things that fathers can do is just be in the room um Mm -hmm. and and you don't necessarily have to always exchange words you don't even have to use words uh you know there there's a lot of situations that dads get super nervous about putting themselves in because they've been either traditionally women's roles Mm -hmm. or it's just something that they've never done before or tried before and i love your idea of don't be afraid to mess up. Like, mm. you know, it's like your kids, they, they love you so much and they just want you around and they just want yeah. you present. That's really what mm. they're looking for more than anything in the world is just to be present. And I love that quote that says, you know, if you hang out with your kids now, they'll want to hang out with you later. And I, mm-hmm. I, I like that adage because I want as I think a lot of people do, I mean, don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. My, my wife's family, they're, everybody's really close and it's a super, super tight community. They go on vacations together. They could spend five days together and they could literally never leave the kitchen table. They could just talk to each mm-hmm. other for five days straight. That's mm-hmm. not how it is in my family that, you know, we, yeah. we, we would probably need a central activity to kind of keep people from killing each yeah. other. Um, mm-hmm. but I, I want to have that with my boys when my boys are my age, I, I really want them to want to spend time with me. And so, you know, part of part of me leaving the radio show was how do I get more time with these dudes while I still have them? I mean, they're 16 to 14. There's like maybe five years left with one of them and, you know, another six or seven with the other. And uh, time goes quick, man. I'm sure you you've blinked and your kids are four and seven, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it just goes so it just goes so quickly. And I think that point about hanging out with your kids now and they want to hang out with you later. It's so true. I think one of my favorite things to do is just play Lego with my son. Mm. And, and my wife looks at me, she's like, you're such a child. I'm like, yeah, because in a way, I'm kind of like, I'm able to do stuff that I would have loved to have done with him, like with my own dad kind of yeah. growing up. So I'm able to now do it with him and actually kind of creating that time to to do that with your children is so important because I think it's very easy to allow the mundane and the day-to-day life to just overtake everything that you're doing. And like you say, before you know it, your kids are grown and you just think, where's all this time gone? And I don't want to look back in 10, 15 years time. And my children were like, well, okay, well, we had a nice upbringing, but you weren't really here Mm. for any of it. So, (laughs) okay. Thank you very much for making sure we had food on the table, but actually it would have been nice to hang out with you a little bit. And that's the thing. I, I love especially during the summers, I love taking my kids to the park. You know, I like, I love taking them out to do stuff with them because I just, I want them to have memories. And I, whenever I look at 
photos and I'm going through my phone. I'm just like, wow, we've done all of this. Um, and, you, you know, and also I've, I document it because I don't want any, any of them to turn around and be like, well, you were never there for me. So let me no. show you photos. Yeah. I got them. Here you go. I've got them. It's not like, it's not like my parents were, you know, with the, with the old Polaroids and the printed out photos. Nope. It's all on iCloud. I'll give you a, you know, give you a password. Have a look. We were there. I was always there. So, yeah. So it's, it, being present is just so, so important uh, in your kids' lives. Because I think when you do that, you might feel like, okay, it's a, it's something, you know, it's a lot, especially when you've got work and, and whatnot. But to me, there's no greater joy that I get than dancing with my, with my daughter or just playing Lego with my son. Um, you know, that for me is just like, that's everything. And those things don't cost a thing. If people wanted to work with you or wanted to get more information about you, where would you like to send them? If you hit us up on Dope Black Dad, so we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, uh, we are on Facebook. So, you know, anyone, any one of those, we've got a website, www.dopeblackdads.org. So go on the website, go on the Facebook group. You know, if you want to join, as I said, we've got an American chapter, UK chapter, South African chapter. You know, just send a friend request into the group. I think we've got over... It's about twenty five thousand people in the groups at the That's moment. Incredible! Um, over a hundred thousand followers on Instagram. So you know we're there, and we're producing. We do content all the time. You know, I podcast for Dope Black all the time, so you'll always hear my voice uh, on the Dope Black Dads podcast. And we release stuff at least two or three times a week. So you know, wow. we're there. We're current. We're you know, we're having these conversations. I, I just did a conversation the other day with someone about the cost of living crisis here in the UK uh, and economy, it, it, the economy and kind of giving tips around that. So we're present. So just hit us up. We're here. We have three goals with Learn From People Who Lived It. One, to help you feel less alone. Two, encourage you to seek out a coach, a therapist, a church, anyone who can help you get through your journey and find some healing. Three, when you're ready, share your story with us. Find Learn From People Who Lived It wherever you get podcasts. Search it using all one word, Learn From People Who Lived It.